there weren't a whole of a lot of choices when you were growing up and everything was a dumbed down lager, um, not as dumbed down as the industrial ones are now. Hey, Drinking Buddies, this is the Drinking Buddies show, where we explore food, craft beverage pairings, and the entrepreneurs and tastemakers behind them. I'm Frank, founder of Drinking Buddy Artisan Snacks, and on today's show, I'll be chatting with two local craft beer celebrities, Daniel Drennan and Tom Carroll, learning about what brought them into a once nearly non-existent craft beer scene, and listening to their experiences and thoughts on the current state of SoCal's breweries. Daniel Drennan is the publisher, editor, and head writer of Beer Paper, the local monthly you'll find at just about any brewery or bottle shop in SoCal. Tom Carroll is a beer educator, judge, traveler, and writer, and has witnessed the explosion of craft beer in Los Angeles. Tom is also the senior contributor of Beer Paper. Despite the stops and starts due to COVID-19, Daniel and Tom continue to support their local breweries and the passionate brewers and entrepreneurs behind them. I was lucky enough to, growing up in New Jersey, to turn 18 in 1972, and that's when the drinking age came down to 18. You know, it made it a lot easier. After too many sick drunks on whiskey and, and spirits and wine, I wasn't finding that in beer. They were just lagers we were drinking, and, and uh, the tall boys had come out, the 16-ounce ones. And I remember my, my go-to beer and beer snack was a Pabst Blue Ribbon tall boy and a bag of uh, Wise barbecue potato chips. And they were real greasy and stuff. But I remember when I moved, in, when I moved to California, we couldn't get them. I was shocked. Friends used to send care packages. And I remember getting this box in the mail. I'm like, God, what is this? It's like, it's like a grease stain on the bottom of it. And I opened it up and it was a couple of bags of wise potato chips. <laughs> wow, that stuff really is grease. When I left New Jersey in 81, there was no decent beer. We couldn't even get Anchor Steam, which was the only other thing out there. Uh, Sierra Nevada had basically just come out in the West. It didn't make it to the East. It was, so the whole good beer all started to happen while while I was in California. Otherwise, I was going to British pub. I guess I didn't know that much the difference between lagers and ales, but these yellow beers you could see through weren't terribly interesting to me, and they all tasted alike. And the ones from Germany tended to be skunk because the lagers are delicate. They, there wasn't a cold chain then, or very few people cared about it. So I would go to English and Irish pubs, and and I would drink Bass and Newcastle and Guinness, of course, and Courage, some of the other ones you can't get anymore. And then we start, you know, Sierra Nevada started to make it down here and Anchor Steam, of course, we could get. And I started, you know, shifting and just looking for those kinds of things. We had brew pubs, Gorky's and uh, Crown City, Pasadena, uh, City of Angels in Santa Monica, and a couple of others. But there was no beer to go. You know, I was mostly buying British and Irish imports. Didn't know much about Belgian beers at all. Every once in a while, I'd take a chance on a German beer. And then when I started to get more and more into beer, and I, I was writing about rock and roll, and I decided that I wanted to learn more about beer because I wanted to write about it for the Celebrator. I was reading the Celebrator for a long time. A friend of mine got into homebrewing, and I told him about this homebrew club I knew, and then he joined it. And he said, Tom, you should join. I said, yeah, but I don't, you know, I don't really brew. I'm not really interested in brewing. I can't, you know, I can't cook, and I sucked in chemistry. And he goes, but there's more about it. You'll learn more about beer. There's this and that. So I went and joined the club. And it was like, wow, it just opened my mind up to all these different things. And, and then there was a homebrew competition. And one guy did this Belgian-style wit beer. It was called Half Wit. And I thought, wow, this is really good. And I rated it, you know, that was my favorite beer. And damn if it didn't become the beer of the party. And I thought, maybe I got to have a palate or something. So the BJCP class became available. One of our members was teaching it. So I took the class. And mainly because I wanted to write about it professionally. And this is pre-internet and you can't just throw anything up there and then change it when somebody calls you on it or when somebody corrects you. But it just opened my mind up to all this stuff. And then in 2004, when I turned 50, I decided I was going to go to Belgium. That's where you got to go if you're into beer. And again, there wasn't much going on here. Stone was around. Unibrow was down here. There, there was no real... Everything was imports, and I figured, well, friends of mine are gone, I'm going to go. And I went, and I ended up selling a story to the LA Times. It's called 50 Beers for 50 Years. So I was only in Belgium for a week, and I drank 49 beers. I probably drank a few more. But I, I did little videos and took notes on every one of them, and then wrote this uh, piece on it. I didn't know that much about Trappist beers. I knew some of the styles. And that sort of launched me not only into beer writing, but into traveling a lot. 
my first trip to Japan was just with my wife and friends and visited a beer writer friend there. And he wasn't judging, but he told me about, we have a competition every September. I go, really? So I started poking them and then, and then they invited me to come. And then once you get on the list, then they invite you all the time. And then when you can't go, you fall off the list. And it was interesting because I was writing about rock and roll and I was getting old, even though I was still into music a lot. But you start writing the same story over and over again. And how many bands are going to be the next Velvet Underground? So I kind of segued from a sideline of writing about music to a sideline of writing about beer. And then beer got really Daniel shares how he fell into writing about craft beer. I was at Duke University getting a public policy degree with the smart idea that I would go to Washington, D.C. after Duke and join my best friend who was a burgeoning rock star in the federal government world already. And we lived out our lives together in D.C., But my heart, my mom was an English teacher growing up. So I had started writing when I was 12 years old. Mm. I was first published, I was a basketball player in North Carolina. And I I used to, when I was 12, I would keep these notebooks. I would write predictions of every single NFL game. The Dolphins are going to beat the Jets 24 to 23. And here's why the quarterback's injured. And the publisher of the local paper in my hometown in North Carolina came over for dinner and my mom was telling him. He said, well, let me see these notebooks. So he starts reading and he asked me, well, what what is your winning percentage, young man, in predicting these games? And I said, "Eh, it's about 75%. He goes, 75%? I said, yeah. He goes, you mind if we start publishing your predictions (laughs) in the paper? That was my first published writing gig when I was 12. And... I wrote everything I could write, poetry, short stories. In college, I had decided I wanted to be a screenwriter. So I went, as most young people did, against my head of going to D.C. for the smart, predictable federal government career. And I moved to L.A. to write screenplays, like a million other people who have moved out here. But realizing, you know, the odds of success in that world are not great. I got a day job with the city of L.A. with my public policy degree and ended up working for city of L.A. for 30 years. And I just kind of fell into environmental policy because, again, like most young people, I was very gung-ho about the environment. And so city of L.A. is such a broad world of opportunity job-wise. I was able to pick an environmental type field. And ultimately ended up being, towards the end of my career, senior environmental policy analyst for both Mayor James Hahn and then Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Meanwhile, I was writing screenplays nights and weekends and ended up writing nine of them and optioning three. So I had a tiny bit of nibble of success, but nothing that ever made it to the theater, unfortunately. And then that segued into, I guess, in a quirky twist of fate, becoming a beer writer, because when I was with the mayor's office, the publishers of the LA Times and the LA Weekly would invite senior mayor staff over to their houses on weekends for wine and cheese parties. And I would be the lowbrow person that would show up with a big fat cooler full of Russian River and Ballast Point and all these different beers, and I would try to turn it into a tasting party. And these higher-ups at the newspapers kept saying, like, who brought this cooler to our (laughs) wine and cheese party? (laughs) And I'm like, oh, sorry, that's me, you know, the government. What's in the cooler? We have everything a human being could need. We have wine, we have cheese, we have charcuterie. I'm going, beer. They're like, beer? I go, yeah, craft beer, local craft beer. They're like, craft beer. What, this is like 12 years ago, by the way. Right. This is like 12 yeah, years right. ago. Yeah. What is craft beer? I'm like, okay. So if none of you guys in this room know what craft beer is, you've just answered the question to why no one under the age of 40 reads a newspaper anymore. Especially you, LA Weekly guy. You're supposed to be the hip what's happening in LA paper. You don't even know what craft beer is? So long story short, he ends up telling me, can you write? And I said, well, I came out here to write screenplays. You know, I can write. He goes, good, on Monday, you're the new LA Weekly beer writer. So I started writing about beer and did that for two years with the LA Weekly. 
I constantly was at odds with my editor from the LA Weekly because she was much a foodie wine person, didn't really quite get or support the craft beer revolution, thought it was a fad that would come and go in a few months. Why are we even writing about this? And my strategy in writing about beer was just to be like an enthusiastic fanboy, kind of, because I felt like it would resonate with my readers because we were all sitting at the same bars together. Back then, Tom knows, there was like six decent beer bars in greater Los Angeles, six. And you would drive across town 30, 45 minutes to go to each of them. Like I would drive from Long Beach all the way to Tony's Darts Away in Burbank or 38 degrees in Alhambra because you had to if you wanted to experience the latest, newest, coolest beers. So we were all over the city back then. And I would sit at the bar with my fellow beer geeks and we'd have, you know, you'd hear these conversations about, oh my God, I think Sculpin's actually better than Pliny, man. Mind blown. So I was trying to capture that passion that was surrounding the revolution. At that time, I got so into it because I felt like this modern wave of American craft brewers were artists the same way that musicians, painters, actors, sculptors are artists. These young guys and ladies were brewing beers that were, you know, centuries old beer styles and suddenly they're like, brown ale? I'm gonna double dry hop it and put blueberries in it. And people are gonna line up and love it. You know, there were no rules suddenly which made it hard for judges, right, Tom? But for drinkers, it was a lot of fun, man. You could go to a place and there was always something new and edgy to try. So I think that's what propelled this whole phenomenon, which is really what it is, the explosion of craft beer. So that's how I segued from government worker. And like Tom, I retired last year from 30 years with the city, mostly because I had the beer paper revenue, so I want to throw out that COVID has killed the beer paper revenue. Beer paper is currently making zero, so please feel bad for us if you're out there listening. When we return, Daniel and Tom share how they met and get into the explosion of craft beer in L.A. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And if you'd like to support us, be sure to try our one-of-a-kind Japanese artisanal snacks and pick up a drinking buddy hat, coaster, and more. Free shipping now available. Go to www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and click on shop for details. Back then, there was about six decent beer bars in Los Angeles. One of them was Surly Goat in West Hollywood. And back in that era, craft beer was, as aforementioned, so new, a lot of people didn't know about it. So the strategy of small breweries and bar owners was to have tap takeovers. So you'd have Kern River, for example, come to the Surly Goat and, you know, they'd bring all these beers from Kernville that nobody in L.A. had had. So all the beer geeks would rush into the Surly Goat and they'd have a full lineup of every Kern River beer. I don't remember who it was. It probably was. Do you remember who it was, Tom? It might have been Firestone Walker. but No, that's what I was going to say. I remember that it was at Surly Goat and that it was Ryan Sweeney. So Ryan Sweeney, who's kind of an iconic figure in L.A. beer, he owns probably a half dozen beer bars around greater L.A. and including one in Maui. And he he introduced Tom. I think Tom actually was sitting on the stool next to me and we didn't know each other. And I was doing L- I was doing L.A. Weekly. He was doing Celebrator. And Ryan Sweeney came up and went, Oh, God, great. You guys are sitting together. I was hoping you'd meet each other. And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? When he goes, this is Tom Carroll from The Celebrator. And I went, oh, good to finally meet you, Tom. And I'll never forget, Tom looks over at me and he goes, I've been looking forward to meeting you too, Daniel, because, you know, all these kids in craft beer, they're all so young. It's finally, it's nice to finally meet somebody in the industry that's my own age. And I'm looking over at Tom going, I am not your age, pal. <laughs> you were insulted, but, right? It was, um, I decided I decided to go all gray. You know, my hair wasn't this long, but that was pretty funny. But I thought, well, this is great because all the other older beer writers moved away. Don Erickson, yeah. who I replaced at the Celebrator. He lived in Long Beach and wrote for the Celebrator since 88. And there was never anything to write about in L.A. His full-time job 
transferred him up to Santa Maria up in the Central Coast. So he had to leave. And I had just started freelancing and doing a couple of extra LA stories, tastings and um, tap take takeover things for the celebrator. And so Tom Daldorf, the publisher, editor, calls me and says, Tom, Erickson's leading. You want to cover LA? And I go, oh, well, sure. And I figure, but what is there going to be to write about? He, he used to mostly write about travels around the country. By my third article, there was stuff to write about in LA. And by a half a year later, I couldn't keep up with a bi-monthly column. It was unless just writing little blurbs. And it was like, what? So suddenly there was a beer scene in LA and I was covering it. And oh, well, all of a sudden, now, now I'm getting pressed for time. No shortage of things to write about. I started with the craft beer bar. And the incentive before Ryan Sweeney and his partner, Brandon Bradford, opened the Verdugo Bar in Glassell Park. But they were preceded by and inspired by Beachwood Barbecue in Seal Beach. But Gabe Gordon there was a chef. They did great food, great barbecue. He was an avid beer drinker and a fan. And he decided, why, why do I have to drive to San Diego to get all these beers? I'm going to find out a way to get them. And he did. And then suddenly, we didn't have to drive to San Diego. We used to make trips maybe six, seven times a year to San Diego just to drink beer. Maybe it was a pizza port beer festival. Maybe it was just a long weekend. Now, all we had to do was go to Seal Beach, which was a hell of a lot closer. Yeah. Absolutely. And and then, you know, that beget the whole uh, Beachwood Brewing Empire. But that's kind of how it started. And then Brian Lenzo, a good friend of Gabe's, opened Blue Palms Brew House in, in Hollywood. And my very first trip to uh, Beachwood, Brian Lenzo was sitting next to me and Gabe introduced me. This is my friend Brian. He's going to open a beer bar in Hollywood. I go, oh, that's great. That's a lot closer to Seal Beach. And he did. And it was great. And it was wonderful. And then Ryan Sweeney opened the Surly Goat and Tony Yano came in with Tony's Darts Away in Burbank. And then we start, they started popping up and people knew what they were doing. You know, they were only serving good beer. And they all have stories of Budweiser reps coming in and saying, what? You don't want our beer? You're not going to be around in six months. And they'd say, all right, come back in six months and we'll see. Tom and Daniel share how they've been coping with the impacts of COVID-19. I just retired uh, just about a year ago. So it's it's kind of weird. It's like the whole world is retired in a way. And uh, it's a lot of things I was uh, planning to do. The UCLA class, a beer lecture, a few other projects all on hold indefinitely now. So it's kind it's kind of strange, but fortunately it isn't. It's, it, there hasn't been a big effect on me financially, health-wise. My wife and I are both healthy. We try to take a walk every day and just run out for what we need to. And I've got a, a home bar where I'm at now. It's, it's chock full of beer. And I'm still going out buying beer to support the local breweries. Because a lot of them are, a lot of them aren't going to make it, you know, especially with this uh, rollback now. And the ones that do are going to be limping along for a bit, I think. Not all of them, but the smaller ones, the ones that don't have outside areas to, to, to use, say, or, you know, aren't, aren't a brew pub. So it's, you know, the, and the rules keep changing almost weekly now. It favors some people, it doesn't favor others. And then there's always the, the risk of infection, not only of employees at a, at a brewery or a brew pub or a restaurant or bar, but the clientele that comes in. It's kind of a scary time. And, and you know, I'm in that supposedly vulnerable age, so it, there's no real incentive for me to go out and have a pint at a bar as much as I'd like to. I got a bar at home. I consider myself one of the much luckier ones. Yeah, I would say, I mean, this sounds counterintuitive, but the COVID crisis has actually been a silver lining blessing for me because over the past three and a half months, I have not been going to three or four beer bars or breweries per day, seven days a week. And therefore, I've lost 21 pounds as of this morning. Been really staying home, playing it safe. We go on a three to four mile a day walk every single day. I'm lucky enough to have a home gym, so I work out for like an hour and a half every single day. The blessings of being a beer writer were pretty well stocked with beer. Beechwood, my home brewery, Beer Papers home brewery, lucky for me, their distribution manager is my neighbor across the street. I keep a fridge full of Beechwood at all times, so there's worse fates than that. But yeah, I, I actually feel probably the best I've felt in 10 years because my philosophy as a beer writer when I started was why does anybody want to read what I have to say about beer? I'm not a historian like Tom. I'm not even a home brewer. 
I don't know jack about the technical aspects of brewing a great beer. I only feel like I know what is a great beer when it's in the glass. And that's all I ever really cared about. And reporting to fellow beer fans, mostly from a point of shared enthusiasm, has always been the tack I've taken on beer. So my stock line has always been, look, I just drink a beer. I smell it. I look at it and I drink it. And it's either delicious, damn delicious, or fucking damn delicious. If your beer does not fall into one of those three categories, sadly, I will no longer be drinking your beer. Because I also say California craft brewing is the best in the history of brewing. In my humble opinion, Tom may may differ since he's more of a, a world sophisticated drinker. I'm kind of in my California bubble, but I do think we do it better than anybody. So we're super spoiled here. And that's been tough with the explosion of breweries over the last 10 years, because really, if you open your brewery and you're brewing, if you're brewing sea beer, eh, you're kind of in a world of hurt in California. Daniel and Tom share how they judge craft beer. Well, I do it, you know, having uh, taken the BJCP class, the Beer Judge Certification Program, which is what got me into uh, beer judging. You know, there are ways you, you judge beers sort of like you sort of like you judge dogs. I used to say, just grab them by the balls and make sure that <laughs> everything is the way it's supposed to be. You know, you could have the sweetest little cocker spaniel, then it's got the great, the best coat, but its gait is a little off when it walks. It's not going to make the best of the breed and then obviously not the best of the show. So sort of the same thing. It doesn't, mean, doesn't mean it's not a, a good or a acceptable dog the same thing with beers you know you're rating beers on how basically judge them to style like like you judge a dog too so there there might be the the most well-made beer and there might be one in the same style that's not quite as well-made maybe it's a little too hoppy for the style but you really like it and there's a form on the bjcp uh score sheets for uh, overall impression and that's where you and then you and then there's one to five i think you could score it higher on that but you wouldn't probably maybe give it a, certainly not a first or second, maybe you'd give it a third, depending on what the competition is, because it, it doesn't quite meet the exact standards. So it's kind of objective, but there's some subjectivity in it anyway. And then the, the first thing that I always tell people when I'm talking about or teaching them about judging beer is that there's a big difference between a beer that's bad or a beer that's off and a beer you, you don't like. Because a lot of times mm. it's just a style you don't like. You know, you don't like multi dunkles. You don't like multi dark beers. Therefore, you can't judge it that way. And I like judging. Every once in a while, I love judging beers that I don't particularly care for, mm. because I know what they're supposed to taste like. Like brown ales. Newcastle, I guess, long ago was the style. Now Newcastle's practically impossible to drink. The Americans, as usual, have hopped things up and says so there's some nice hoppy browns, and things. But it com- you come across the like a proper brown bitter or some of those old British styles uh, from 50, 60 years ago. And it's like, wow, this is just what this is supposed to taste like. It's not exciting. It would never sell at a, at a craft beer bar where everybody wants the latest thing, the latest milkshake beer, the hoppiest thing. But it's just, this is, this is, you could just imagine sitting 60 years ago in a pub in London drinking this. So it's a whole range of styles. And I too, I try to, you know, drink what I haven't had. When, you know, back in the day, we'd go into a bar, I'd look and I'd go, yeah, I've had that, oh, they got plenty of the elder on, that's great. I know that's a great beer. I don't need to taste it. Right. I don't need to drink it. And I know none of the other IPAs are probably going to come close to it, but I haven't had that one, so I'm going to order it. And then I'll oh, wait, that was better than I thought. Or, yep, to this, to that, to little of this. It's it's all about uh, deciding what you want and if you want to continue to, to drink more. And a lot of times you just make mistakes. Damn, I, sh- I should have ordered that strawberry goza. <laughs> They didn't get it. I should have gone with something I like. But, you know, those are the chances to take. Tom and Daniel share their thoughts on how COVID-19 is affecting SoCal's breweries. I've heard multiple people throw out the Darwinism aspect of COVID. If there are breweries going under, they may have been teetering on that before COVID. And COVID was just the final nail in the coffin. I mean, the breweries that brew fantastic beer and have a massive loyal following, I mean, they're going to survive this and be fine. Probably everybody has taken a four-month financial hit 
because your tasting room is not open. And if you're following the Brewers Association reports, the sad part of the small, intimate brewery settings that we all know and love so much, the local guys, is that a large chunk of their revenue was from taproom sales. Mm -hmm. And taproom sales are their part of their meat and potatoes because there's no middleman. If they use a distributor, then they're giving up 30%. And if it's off-premise and grocery store sales, you know, they're getting a sliver of the money. But everything they sell in their own tasting room is 100% going in their pocket. So it's a huge difference. That's why the big regional breweries, I was just reading an article yesterday, may actually be doing better because of everybody drinking at home and going out to the grocery stores or the liquor stores and bringing beer home. So if you're nationally or even regionally distributed, you're probably doing okay. But it's the little mom and pops, the local breweries that were 80% taproom sales or more. Even if the other 20 was sending their kegs down the street to a beer bar, that's not working for them either. So they're the ones in jeopardy. Right. Well, of course, in California, you can self-distribute, which is part of the reason why our craft beer industry was pretty stable once it started. We, we didn't lose too many people. And, and the folks down in uh, Escondido, Stone Brewing, they recognized that pretty quickly. Not only distrib- start a distribution company to distribute stone, but they started distributing what would be their competitors. Lost Abbey, they picked up Russian River very early, which is why. We're lucky to get Russian River in Southern California. But Daniel's right. It's all about the markup that that happens when you you use an outside distributor. So if companies are, when you start real small, you can self-distribute. I remember Eagle Rock interviewing Jeremy when he first opened uh, Eagle Rock. I said, how often do you brew? And he goes, maybe twice a week. The other, I go, what do you do the rest of the days? He said, I'm delivering beer. I'm going over fixing uh, kegerators for bars. I'm giving them new tap handles. I interviewed him while he was on an errand. So they were able to do that. And then, you know, they do have a distributor now, an outside distributor. Tom shares his thoughts on the Jibiru or craft beer scene in Japan. But Jibiru biru technically means local beer, right? Right. Uh, but they've used it as a, as a um, to mean craft beer. It's fascinating. Brian Harrell, who is an American my age, married a Japanese woman. She didn't want to leave her family, so he moved to Japan. So he'd been living in Japan since 1977. And when they started in, what was it, 94, they loosened the rules about opening breweries, small breweries, because it's been very difficult. Uh, there's a beer bar that opened then that's still around called Beer Club Popeye. I can't remember the suburb or the part of Tokyo, but it's where the sumo wrestling is headquartered. But their beers are really interesting because they're like most Japanese food. It's very subtle, very well done. And when you go over there as an American into craft beer and you try to drink some of the Japanese beer, you're sort of set back because most of it is just so subtle. What? You call this an IPA? (laughs) It's like, yeah, because it's just not loaded with West Coast hops. But they are influenced by what we do. There are beer bars that specialize in American beer, Craft Heads in Tokyo and Koji. He comes over twice a year and he buys a bunch of kegs American beer, and he takes them to LAX, and he puts them on a pallet, and he flies them back. So they come back really fresh, and he charges a fair amount for them. So you pay fifteen dollars, and I remember seeing El Segundo Mayberry, and it was so fresh. It was like, oh my god, I've had less fresh Mayberry in LA. And I said, when did you get it? He goes, oh yeah, this this just came in the other day. But every time I go, I I try to go to Craft Heads, and I think yeah, you asked about the breweries. Um, I like the Shiga Kogan. Hmm. You know, they're out in um, where the snow monkeys are. We went to visit yeah. snow monkeys in. in it's in Nagano. That's right. Uh, actually, yeah. it's Nagano. And then Yoho Brewing is out there. I know the, hmm. the brewmaster there, too. I met him at the first Firestone International. They invited Yoho, and he spoke so little English. And then we just stayed in touch. And now he's, he's a brewmaster there. And Baird Brewing, I like a lot. And. Baird opened a tap room in Culver City called mm. the Harajuku Tap Room. Oh, yeah, Adam. So I've been learning a bit more about sake from them because they're only about four miles from me. And it's so tiny. I, I just go for takeout now since the COVID happened. Daniel and Tom talk the future of beer paper and beer events in LA. I mean, we're kind of stuck on a wait and see 
position. I did talk to Gabe Gordon at Beachwood recently about it because he's one of our flagship advertisers. He's had a full page ad for seven years. And I said, look, you know, I always consider beer paper advertisers who are mostly breweries and beer bars as partners. I don't even like to think of them as advertisers. We're trying to sell the same thing, which is great California craft beer. And Gabe's point, and I agree with it, is until tasting rooms are back open at some semblance of normalcy where you have a a crowded tap room, that's probably how long it's going to be before you see a stack of beer papers again. Because, you know, if it's if it's even half full due to social distancing, then you've cut the advertising revenue at least in half. We might at some point have to come out with a small, we've always been 24 pages. So who knows, maybe we come back out with a 12 page issue. So I'm just perched on the ledge watching the whole thing. And you know, as soon as we can get back in print, we will get back in print. And I think beer fans will look forward to that. But like Tom said, I have a gut instinct. It's probably easily going to be 2021 before that day comes. Yeah, the bar, the bars are the hardest things. I mean, we're seeing what's happening, you know, in Texas and Florida, and we're getting all these spikes from not, not so much from the from the Black Lives Matter protests and police brutality protests, but more from the Memorial Day and summer reopenings all around because there were a lot of people cheek to jowl in a, in a pool or cheek to jowl in, a, in an enclosed bar. You know, and now 4th of July, and every day California is logging more and more cases and soon the deaths are going to start. So it's, it's tough, oh, beer festivals too. And actually, yeah, I'm not, I helped with the first couple of LA Beer Week just to be on the record with that because it was put on by basically the brain child of ryan sweeney and his partner and jay Baum and dennis hartman who were in beer distribution and import they work for import distribution companies and the first la beer week happened before there was an la craft beer bar uh eagle rock was not quite ready they missed it by about three weeks so stone was represented and it was the guys that work in imports and distribution. There was a sh- you know, lots of Chimay, lots of Franz and Kiner, all, all, all these, you know, the, the distributors would do a handful of German and Belgian beers, so they were well represented. There was some stuff from Northern California, some things from San Diego, but mostly it was Stone, maybe Al Smith. And I missed the first Holly Beer Week because I, I was actually on that. I helped work on it, setting it up, did some PR for it. And then I was in, in Europe for the whole thing. I went to the opening party at Nausea's in Redondo Beach that everybody came out for from you know, the east side. And of course it was hosted by Stone and they did it for several years because we didn't have a beer seat. And uh, then I went home and packed and got on a plane the next day. So, and then when I got home, it was the day after the, the festival. And then I've been involved again with the last few or the, the next couple, the second and third. And I, that's when I started doing panels, putting together uh, educational panels, usually one or two. And once the Los Angeles Brewers Guild was founded, which I think was until 2013, then they sort of handed it over to the Brewers Guild. And then there were enough, there's almost what, not, somewhere around 95 members of the LA Brewers Guild now. Um, we've probably lost some. And so it's everything at a standstill. So obviously you couldn't do a beer festival. And some people are trying to do a virtual one. I don't know. You know, some people have tried, I haven't gone to one, but I don't know how that's going to happen. So I would think summer of next year is possible, but you still might need some social distancing. Yeah, because I figured either it would be virtual this year or you have to wait until either they have a vaccine or we get over some sort of a hump and it's, the numbers right. are going down. Breweries don't have time for that. Even the healthy ones are somewhat fighting for survival. They've had to reinvent themselves several times during this. Every time there's a reclosure, They've all gone into canning. If they weren't in canning before COVID, they're in canning now. So they have to bring in a mobile canning line to get their product out there. As I said earlier, they're not sending kegs to local beer bars anymore because they're not open. So you reach out to them and go, that's why I haven't even reached out to them because I know it's a sensitive time 
financially for everybody. Like I'd love to send a group email to everybody going, Hey man, you know, beer paper is supporting you. We're online now. We're still doing cover stories and articles. So we're trying to stay in the game and relevant to LA beer fans, but I'm not going to reach out to brewery owners right now and say, Hey, what about beer paper? When can we all get together and strategize? Cause they're strategizing on how to keep staff, how to keep right. afloat. So I would suggest that LA Beer Week and a festival is the furthest thing from any of their mind. Yeah, from everybody's mind. And the thing about craft beer is that it, it's spread by word of mouth. And uh, it's interesting because San Diego was, was fairly early, much earlier than LA. And it was before blogging and all this social media really took off. So the West Coaster magazine monthly really took off and people were happy to advertise because there was so much going on. You know, they supported the breweries and, and the breweries supported the paper and there weren't really any competing beer blogs at that time. Beer paper came much later at the same, right around the same time West Coaster tried to launch a, a Southern, like a Santa Barbara, West Coaster, to, uh, Santa West Barbara Coaster, to Orange Coaster, County. Okay. Yeah. And it was only quarterly and I, I wrote a few things for them. And trying to pitch them on letting me edit it since it was only quarterly and they didn't want me to edit it. Basically you have an Orange County story, an LA story, Santa Barbara, something like that, San Luis Obispo. So that's it. It's one story from everything. They didn't get as much advertising because again, the scene had already taken off in LA without advertising. But when Rob and Aaron started Beer Paper before Daniel, he, they got advertising support early on. And when Daniel took over, they, it came on even more. And it's because you're getting relationships with local people. And because of Beachwood, and your home base there, they're happy to do that. They didn't, they used to advertise in the Celebrator, but most people didn't advertise, you know, and like the Celebrator, Sierra Nevada and Russian River used to take out ads to the Celebrator just because they wanted to, the Celebrator was around for a long time and so were they. But there was no need, there was no need to advertise craft beer. So it was really hard. That's part of the reason why the Celebrator went under. There was just too many other, too many breweries and too much to cover. And everybody had stories. We all wanted to write longer columns or longer articles because there was so much to cover and there wasn't enough advertising. They just couldn't keep it going, sadly. And that's, you know, what's happened to a lot of print. So beer papers is done much, much better because of that. But I think you're right. The last thing they're going to do is spend money on advertising. If anything, they're going to hire somebody back that they had a layoff. So I don't know, but the way I think of it is it's, uh, for years people say, no, oh, they say craft is hitting a bubble, especially in California or in San Diego in particular, but I don't, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I'm like, well, sure. Sooner or later it is because there's just limited amount of tap space, limited amount of shelf space. At a certain point, a certain amount is too much, but COVID came in and blindsided everybody. And that's popping that bubble, but we don't know what the residue is going to look like until we return to whatever the new normal is. What's also helped California is the uh, California Craft Brewers Association, the lobbying, the state's lobbying group, got the ABC laws changed so that you could take beer away, that you could, anybody could fill growlers, that bars could fill growlers. And that's helped keep people afloat. And what we're hoping is, I'm hoping anyway, is that when people are able to open again, that they keep that maybe forever, at least for several years, because that might make the difference of whether somebody comes back and survives or comes back and fails. Some people are just not comfortable going into a bar and drinking, but they can go in and put a mask on and, and order something and sanitize their hands and sanitize their credit card and pay for it and leave and get the beer and they get the money. And so they get the business, and, but they don't get people sitting in there until people feel safe doing it. And we don't know how long that's gonna be. And you know, the way things are going in this country, it's just back and forth, stop, start. Tom and Daniel give their recommendations on supporting the craft beer industry during the crisis. Our slogan is drink local, read local. So I think part of this whole movement has been the concept of your neighborhood brewery or beer bar. First of all, we don't want you traveling great distances and interacting with other people. So I'd say stay close to home and support your favorite that's in your neighborhood, whether it's your beer bar, your brewery. Like I said, in my case, we've always been incredibly lucky that Beer Paper, a major beer publication, is based in Long Beach. And our home brewery, Brew Pub, just happens to be the multiple time best brew pub in America and the world at Great American Beer Festival and World Beer Cup. 
with one of the best brewers in the world, Julian Trega. So we're crazy lucky that Beachwood's right in our yard, but my advice would be just support your local guy that you like, you know, you don't need to drive across town or somewhere. I mean, I haven't been doing it because I don't want to get out there. So I'm not going to drive to El Segundo from Long Beach. I'm not going to drive to Green Cheek from Long Beach. I'm not going to go over to Orange County. I mean, in the old days, I mean, that's why I said it's been a healthy lifestyle change for me because my daily routine was to go to three or four breweries all over greater Los Angeles and Orange County. So now I've kind of been landlocked at home, drinking beer out of my fridge. So my advice is just keep it safe, keep close to home until we're on the other side of this. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I have to echo the, uh, the drink local and also supporting a lot of people in my homebrew club, Pacific Gravity, have gone on to farm breweries. Uh, Jonathan Porter with Smog City in Torrance, Kip Barnes with LAL Works in Hawthorne, Joe Kovac with um, Tortugo in Inglewood, which is real close to me. Actually, Three Weavers in Inglewood is my local. The Firestone Propagator Brew Pub in Venice is also a but they don't quite need the money as much. I mean, they're going to be okay because they're big enough and they've got Duval behind them. But they're doing amazing things. And I buy cans and bottles and growlers and growlers and, and kegs even because I have a kegerator over there. I see that right behind you, yeah. So, you know, drinking um, low, low alcohol beer like Fly Jack, the 4% hazy from Firestone. The Little Bowl Pills, the Czech style pills are from Smog City that's about four and a half. What I want to drink in the heat and... I'm home all day, and if I want to drink, I want to drink something light so I don't pass out. I can second that. I just went camping, took my family down to Ronald uh -huh. Casper's in Orange County, and I had a little bow pills, and it worked well And when you don't have any air conditioning, but it was a perfect night because we had a little fire, full moon. I had a couple crawlers from the Smog City and Steelcraft here in Long Beach. I ran out of CO2 for my kegerator, so I so we went out on a Sunday, got there in like 20 minutes to Eagle Rock and filled my CO2 and then went to Eagle Rock uh, Brewery and picked up some cans and crawlers and just missed Jeremy, sadly, but, but it was great to get over there and show some support because that's just so far away. I wouldn't be driving there if I didn't have to go there for something else. You can read more about Daniel and Tom online at www.beerpaperla.com and follow Beer Paper on Instagram and Twitter at Beer Paper LA. Coming up on The Drinking Buddy Show, I'm chatting with John Passo, professional brewer and co-host of the Starter and a Chaser podcast. We'll chat about his brewing experiences in NorCal and Ohio and what he loves about the Cleveland craft beer beverage scene. Thanks for listening to The Drinking Buddy Show. Be sure to subscribe and share it with your buddies. Check out our latest artisanal snack offerings at www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care and drink well.